In spite of the curly crop, I don't see the son Joe whom I left a year ago, said Mr. March. I see a young lady who pins her collar straight, laces her boots neatly, and neither talks slang nor lies on the rug as she used to do. Her face is rather thin and pale just now, with watching and anxiety, but I like to look at it, for it has grown gentler, and her voice is lower. She doesn't bounce, but moves quietly, and takes care of a certain little person in a motherly way which delights me. I rather miss my wild girl, but if I get a strong, helpful, tender-hearted woman in her place, I shall feel quite satisfied. I don't know whether the shearing sobered our black sheep, but I do know that in all Washington I couldn't find anything beautiful enough to be bought with the five and twenty dollars which my good girl sent me. Hello and welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And it's lovely to have you back here. And this time around, we're going to be talking about Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. Yeah, I'm really excited to be doing this. It's a bit of a departure from some of the books we've talked about together before, but I think we'll have a lot of creative things to say. And also, I think it'll connect back to some of the issues we talked about before with Christine de Pizan, but not just with Christine. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I feel weird saying this. Spoiler warning, we will be talking about the entire plot. This is the first time where it's felt like spoiler warnings might be something we'd have to do. I mean, of course, you should assume coming to a podcast like this, talking about a book like this, that there would be spoilers. But there's a certain sense in which there are things that happen in this novel that you might not want to know about when you start reading it. Yeah. And not just the really big things, but also smaller kinds of things that happen to people. Um, so I guess for somebody who hadn't read Little Women before, I would say maybe read the first couple of chapters and you know see how far you want to go with it. But I think it's worth comparing it with some of the other texts that we've talked about, like the Iliad, mm. where we started it off saying, Everybody who sees this already knows Absolutely. the plot. So we're looking at a very different kind of text right now, and I thought we might want to talk a bit about that first. Yeah, is that just the novel, or is that something else? I mean, are there some novels that we might talk about where we can take it for granted that everybody knows how it's going to end up? I mean, when we do Moby Dick, maybe it'll be like that. We don't have to worry about giving away spoilers, and that's a novel, right? Sort of very weird novel, but sort of. Well, exactly. And I think maybe some of the weirdness of that novel is that it doesn't fall into this idea that... I, I mean, this isn't quite where the, the the name novel comes from, but you sometimes you go to a novel looking for the novelties in the plot, looking for things that will surprise you mm-hmm. as you read it. Mm-hmm. So that is why this idea of having a spoiler, mm. because the novel's particular pleasure for the first time reader is sometimes those unexpected twists, which isn't true of every genre. No. But because the novel is, for most of us, the primary or first type of literature that we learn to read, that we fall in love with. It's like the default almost. Yeah. And then when we approach other types of texts, we expect it to be like that. Mm -hmm. But obviously those poems and epics and other, other, other works offer up different kinds of pleasures. They're not interested in this idea of novelty. No, I think that's right. On the other hand, you know, I think it's good to give the spoiler alert, but also, I mean, to a certain extent, Little Women, I think, is one of those books where if a person knows it at all, they kind of know in grand terms how it ends up because each of the four main figures is almost like a type, right? We have a sense of what kind of destiny each type of person is going to have. So on the one hand, the spoiler alert is a really good idea. And on the other hand, there's a real sense of, um, how can I put it, Uh, you know ahead of time what kinds of fates these people are going to have. You do, although you might also read the book hoping very much that they don't land on those fates. That's definitely true. Some of those fates for some of those characters feels not like what you want them to have. Mm. You're invested in different futures, especially the futures that they imagine for themselves early on in the book. Yeah. If I can give, like, just sort of flashing ahead one really brief example of that, um, the character of Meg, and we'll lay out the characters in a moment, who's, uh, on the one hand, is is a good girl. She's the oldest sister. She looks after everybody else. And that's a certain kind of role that a lot of us can, I think, identify with. But at the same time, she does have other kinds of ambitions for herself. She loves to act. She has a sense of the dramatic. She wants an interesting and exciting life for herself. And she ends up in a life where she's she's said to be very happy, but she has to surrender her autonomy in a really... I remember as a kid reading this really depressing kind of way when there's a quarrel between her and her husband, she's the one who has to sort of sidle up and apologize. She's not allowed to be angry. Um, and so when, you know, when we, when they have fates that we may not have wanted for them, sometimes that's in grand terms, but sometimes it's something quite subtle, like, like that moment where she has to sort of sidle up and apologize. 
So the book is in two parts. The first part, Little Women, was published on its own in 1868. And then the second half, which was published initially under the title Good Wives, is part two of the book. And then it was published together as one single book, Little Women, subsequently. And the two parts have, in some ways, a very symmetrical relationship, and they're positioned in time relative to the Civil War. So we're hearing about the lives of individual human beings, but it's against the backdrop of the Civil War. So part one starts out at Christmas in 1861, so the war has just started. Uh, it ends around Christmas, 1862, so we've been through kind of a cycle of time. And then part two starts three years later. The war is over. So the war is kind of, I don't know, the clock ticking in the background. Um, so we don't hear a whole lot about the war, but it's there. It's like, I don't know what to call it, like a drumbeat kind of underneath. Yeah, it plays a certain role in the first book because their father is serving in the war, as I believe, as a chaplain. That's but, right. And this causes a certain number of hardships to the family and also to other people in the community. Uh, and, and they find that there's some description of them finding comfort with some of their neighbors who are also experiencing the losses of war. But it is a very quiet effect. And certainly the second book deals with it much less. Oh, yeah. It's just a memory. Yeah. I think in book two. Absolutely. And so the book has this very formal structure, this two-part structure, and that sort of time function marked by the war in the background. And then it's also got this really intensely focused kind of structure around the four girls. So that's laid out at the very outset of the narrative. We've got these four sisters, um, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. And each one of them has a very distinctive character. They're almost, as I said before, like a type. They have a particular kind of character. The uh, eldest sister, who's kind of the good girl, she looks after the others. The second sister, who's quite boyish, outlandish in ways that we will talk about. Um, she loves her freedom perhaps a little too much. Um, the third daughter, Beth, who's um, more shy, retiring, stays at home, uh, loves uh, dolls and animals. And then the fourth sister, Amy, who's at the time the book begins, really still a child. She's really on the threshold of entering into her, her, her adolescence. So these are the, the four sisters, um, you know, beginning at age 16, going down to about age 11, are, are entering into that sort of corridor into adulthood. And that, that four-part structure ends up being really important throughout the whole book. And it's set up very early on, the very first few paragraphs of the book. Each one is a short sentence or two dedicated to each of the four children in order that tries to very quickly sketch their, their characters. And then the entire first chapter or first two chapters hammers this home, really keeps repeating, here's the one child, here's the other child, here's the other child, in here's order. the other child. Yeah. Almost invariably in order. When the girls are said to be building, making little gardens for themselves outside, the four gardens are described, again, in age, order, eldest to youngest. And the kinds of flowers and plants that they grow, they're almost like an allegory for what, who the girls are. And it's just a million of these kinds of things throughout the whole book. And you have to wonder, what is that for? Like, why that strong order? And then there's another kind of ordering that happens amongst the girls where each of them has their sort of special charge. Um, Meg, the oldest, is especially close to and looks after Amy, the youngest. And Joe and Beth, the second and third daughter, they have a particularly close relationship. And there are other relationships that link the, the siblings positively or aggressively, right, in, at different times. But that four-part structure and that kind of concatenations within it drive that book in some really interesting ways. Now, the book is based on uh, Louisa May Alcott's sisters. She was one of four, and she's very much the Joe. Yeah, her sisters called her Lou. That was her nickname. Right, right. And so that's one of the reasons why there are four there. And it seems like, it, in a certain sense, they are given these four distinct personalities, both perhaps reflecting the four sisters, but also as a kind of structure to start writing the book. Hmm. Because... Louisa May Alcott didn't really want to write this book. She, yeah. was, she was talked into it by her uh, publisher and by uh, her family. And she wrote a few chapters which she thought were dreadful, the first few chapters of the book. But they showed them to some actual girls who quite liked them a lot. So she was like, well, okay. Mm -hmm. She was she was willing to follow the money rather than her innate sense of art. And she ended up writing a lot of children's literature, which was, I mean, uh, Little Women is the one volume that gets particularly read nowadays, but a lot of those books were super popular. They sold a lot of copies. Yeah. Little Women, in addition to Good Wives, which later became incorporated into the book, there are two further sequels. Yeah. There's Little Women, then there's Little Men and Joe's Boys. And then there's another one that she wrote, which was quite popular, Eight Cousins, which has a sequel, Rose and Bloom. And then there's a whole bunch of others too. I read a lot of them. They're absolutely fascinating, I think. Uh, I mean, they're children's literature, but there's a lot of stuff going on there um, in terms of social expectations and also what things are possible and what things are not possible. It seems to me it runs through all of her, all of her children's writing. So why don't you give us a brief rundown of the 
of the plot. Okay, there's an awful lot of detail in the plot, so I'm not going to try to get too entangled in the in the different threads. But basically, we have this really strong four part structure. The girls are almost like a world unto themselves, like a little microcosm that household, and that household gets shook up when Joe makes friends with their next door neighbor, a teenage boy named Lori, and he becomes especially close with Joe, but he becomes almost a member of the household. He starts to refer to their mother as mother. You know, um, uh, they have a really affectionate kind of relationship that develops over time. And it's clear that Lori's entering into their household group is complicated in all kinds of ways. Uh, In some ways, it enriches it. It's clearly really positive. But it also disrupts that balance structure. So the girls have different kinds of, I want to say career paths, and that's an incredibly anachronistic thing to say, but they really are different pathways into their futures. Meg works as a governess. Joe helps out their Aunt March, an elderly relative that she sort of comes in and does some stuff for her by the day. Uh, Amy goes to school. Beth stays at home and looks after the house. So they kind of have a set of tasks. And the whole question of what you're obliged to do, what you want to do, what your ambitions for yourself are, and what you owe to others, especially those in your household, but also beyond your household, is what is just driving these chapters one after another. So each chapter has a different vignette, but the dynamic that's going on within them is always about this question of what you want for yourself and what you're obliged to do for others, which sounds kind of like a bummer, but it plays out in a lot of different ways. And sometimes in intensely self-satisfying kinds of ways, and in sometimes in ways that are, um, I think, incredibly depressing. So I'm sure we'll talk about some of those vignettes in a bit. But the first book, Most of the first book consists of chapters that are self-contained vignettes that display some of the different characters in different combinations, undergoing different trials and tribulations. And then at the latter half of the book, there are a few events that sort of stretch out across the chapters when Beth falls sick Mm -hmm. and when their father, who is away, as I said, as a chaplain in the Civil War, also falls sick. Mm -hmm. And this leads to the mother rushing off to tend to the father in Washington, D.C., and it leads to then the question of, does she need to come back and look after her dying daughter? Yeah. And that is such a fascinating section of the book for a number of reasons. Like One is that it looks like the the girls, the sisters have been put in an impossible situation. Their father's away at war. Their mother's gone off to nurse him. They're on their own. There's a household servant, Hannah, who's there to kind of keep an eye on things. And then there's the elderly neighbor, the grandfather of their friend, Lori, uh, Mr. Lawrence, who's there in case there's an emergency, right? But basically, these teenage girls are on their own. And on the one hand, it's kind of a terrifying, awe-inspiring task that's set to them. But also, it's an extraordinary degree of autonomy that they have briefly there. So so I always feel like there's this little weird, I don't know, frisson in that section of the book where on the one hand, it's really worrisome, it's dangerous, uh, all kinds of things can go wrong. And they, um, uh, the, that, that's um, almost fatal illness at that point is clearly a sign that things could go really, really wrong. But they do keep it together. Everything works out fine. And, and that's a taste of, I don't know, independence and freedom in a way. That's one of the many ways in which the book kind of offers a vision of what could be. Uh, before it takes it away and tells you what it is. And it's one that's interestingly echoed by an earlier vignette where they get a week off Mm. and spend it, as their mother would say, very foolishly and idly. Isn't that awful, that chapter? It is, and I'm sure we'll we'll come back to this. But but it's interesting that they they do a very poor job of it, according to how they judge themselves. Uh, And then... They come back and then they're given the second opportunity and they do quite well. Mm-hmm. So this is this is one of the evolutions that is occurring. Yeah, I think you're right to link those two moments. Absolutely. So the first book ends with Beth getting better, the father getting better and returning home. It's Christmas again. It's Christmas again. And this is a much happier Christmas than the Christmas that opened the book. And also it ends with a proposal mm-hmm. uh, to Meg, the oldest sister, by the tutor of Lori, uh, Mr. Brooke, and... She doesn't intend to accept, but then the aunt says, well, if you did accept, I would never give you any money. And she gets so incensed by this that she decides to accept his proposal. She doesn't even decide. This is the thing that's really unnerving, right? The aunt is like, you know, uh, you'll never have any of my money. And and uh, Meg gets all kind of... Um, how can I put it, her independence and fieriness of spirit, such as it is, is stirred up by this. And so in an act of rebellion, she basically says that, you know, if she, she, she loves him and she wants to be with him. And if she wants to be with him, that's what she's going to do. And then, you know, the, the aunt leaves, she's really upset. And John Brooke comes back in and um, she can't say no to him, right? She She's almost parodically passive in that scene with him. And so it's this weird irony, right? That this is her ultimate act of rebellion is to be in a, a to enter into a marriage, which like, it's, it's supposed to be really happy. There's a lot of language about how happy she is, but it's characterized over and over again by him being an incredible bully to her. I, I don't even know what to make of that. It's so depressing. It It is. It 
it's an interesting note to end the book on, and it's an interesting note to start the second book on, yeah. which, uh, as we said, was published under the title Good Wives. And it is very much about marrying or killing off these these uh, sisters. Exactly. So it begins with the marriage of Meg, which is perfectly nice as far as weddings go, I suppose. But then she sets up her household, and it is very hard. Mm. And it's very hard in ways that seem to me... <laughs> very unfair to Meg. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there's an infamous early scene where... The her, jelly pot. The jelly pot oh scene. Oh my God, that chapter makes me so angry. It's it's an amazing chapter. She's told her husband, hey, bring home a friend anytime you want. This is going to be a great Don't household. even tell me. Don't even tell me. And he doesn't for a long time. And then she says one morning, oh, I'll be making jelly today. And it's her first time making jelly, I guess. Jelly is very tricky to make. So it goes badly for her. And this turns out to be the day that John decides to bring home a friend. And he has to know that this is the day the jelly is happening because he's arranged to send home like a kid to pick the, the currants in the backyard or whatever, right? Oh, yeah. so, so he knows about this. You know, he admits that he had forgotten it later yeah. on. But if he's forgotten it. And so and so he just shows up and she is completely at her wit's end. She spent all day trying to get this to work. She's too proud to ask for help from anyone. It's just gone terribly. The house is full of jars of jelly liquid. And, you know, so what does he do? He whines at her and then laughs at her when he realizes what the problem is. Because mm-hmm. he's a great guy. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so yeah, so she's angry, right? And he's angry. She's angry, right? He goes away with the friend, makes, you know, makes a joke out of it, then they they like they eat something together in the kitchen and leave right she's she's retired upstairs to the bedroom and then later on he's real mad at her right and he won't even speak to her and it's on her to apologize and there's this there's this moment that happens i just want to read a few lines of it just because it makes me so incredibly angry um ironically so uh, he's sitting there reading his paper they're kind of ignoring each other and um she's feeling more and more unhappy about this so this was the first serious disagreement Her own hasty speeches sounded both silly and unkind as she recalled them. Her own anger looked childish now, and thoughts of poor John coming home to such a scene quite melted her heart. She glanced at him with tears in her eyes, but he did not see them. She put down her work and got up, thinking, I will be the first to say, forgive me. But he did not turn his head. For a moment, she felt as if she really couldn't do it. And then she leans over and kisses him on his forehead. And then he takes her on his lap, like if she was not infantilized enough already. (laughs) And I'm just like... I don't think that's I don't and I don't think that's an incredibly anachronistic response. I think we're meant to understand Meg's happiness as in part constituted by this submission. And it's how, what do you do with that? Right? That's a happy ending? I mean it clearly it, that's the paradox, right? It clearly is on some level a happy ending. Only it's she's had to sacrifice so much and she's doing it again here. And it will come up again a bit later. Meg will have uh twin children, a boy and a girl with ridiculous names. <laughs> And they're completely irritating characters once they get to talk. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, as the kids are growing up, she becomes completely devoted to her role as mother and ignores him in favor of the kids, but also doesn't involve him in the raising of the kids until both of them are completely frayed by this. He, with her blessing, I guess, spends most of his time hanging out with uh, this friend who he'd brought home that one time with the jelly incident. And she gets ever deeper into the kids, but they start drifting apart, as you could imagine they would, not spending that much time together. And Meg in particular being completely stressed out by dealing with these two twins on her own. And her mom is like, you have to pay more attention to John. Yeah. Oh my God. (laughs) You have to, here, take take Hannah, Mm -hmm. because she will actually take care of the kids. You take care of the house and take care of John, which is interesting, both as a solution, because it really requires having the ability to access a a maid Mm -hmm. uh, to take care of some of that work for you. But it also does place all the responsibility on her. Mm -hmm. To be fair, it is positive that the father, John here, gets involved in looking after the kid. But that dynamic is absolutely unnerving. Yeah. And the fact that it does seem like one of the answers to this is to not let John know that he should have been doing his part of the work, that he should have shown some initiative Mm -hmm. in terms of preventing the situation from happening and not just sitting there being like, well. Well, I mean, that's one of the keys to the book, right? The book is, if it's about anything, it's about women managing men. Mm. I mean, 
from beginning to end. Uh, and it even kind of alludes to this sometimes in connection with um, the father of the four girls, right, Mr. March. Um, he's away with the military in the, the first half of the book. And in the second half of the book, he's around, but he's kind of this absent presence. And there's even this one passage where Alcott describes how uh, it may look like he wasn't really doing anything in the house, but actually the women of the house are constantly going to him for advice. But he's actually just hanging out and like doing absolutely nothing. So in his case, and then also in the management of John Brooke that you were just describing, the, the way Laurie is in some ways a very self-driven, autonomous character, but is also ultimately managed by the other characters, above all by Amy. Um, so this is a book that in a way is about things women have to give up, but it's also in a very strange way about women's power women's ability to control their environment. And if we talk about why is this a book that people keep reading, or at least some people keep reading, one of the sources of that fascination, I think, is in that it is about women's power, the limits on it, um, and the possibilities. And even if those possibilities do get foreclosed at a certain point, you can't put it back in the box, right? It's been opened up to you. Yes. And it also gives some sense of how women might go about not only controlling men in that sense, but also controlling themselves yeah. and each other. It's very much explaining a lot of the details of what goes into that, of what you need to be paying attention to if you want to make a, a certain kinds of difference, uh, both in yourself and in others. And even if you are seeing flaws in yourself, of how to sort of recognize them, work with them or around them, deal with them. Uh, it, it it really does go into quite a lot of good detail on that. And that goes on over a long period of time, like dealing with these flaws, dealing with these issues in yourself. On the one hand, these, these sometimes involve short-term solutions, but they're also part of very long arcs in the narrative. Yeah, I think we might as well then now bring in the other scene of, of women's anger that is very noticeable, which is at one point, Joe is confronted by her mother and... Uh, Joe is at the point where she is worked up and she's gotten upset about something that she's done and she's realized that it's her fault and she's now ready to listen to the wisdom of the mother. This is when she almost killed Amy. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point of the novel. Yes. So just to briefly summarize, Amy has done something really terrible to Joe and Joe is very, very, very angry. And as a result, when Amy follows after Joe and Lori when they go ice skating and falls through the ice, Joe blames herself for not having um, taken care and looked back at Amy and, and expressed concern for her. And so she's she's like, if, if Amy dies, it's going to be all my fault. And that's the state of mind that Joe is in when she talks to her mom. Yes. And uh, do you have the passage in front I of you? I do. So Joe is in a passion of tears saying, it's my dreadful time. Temper. I try to cure it. I think I have. And then it breaks out worse than ever. Oh, mother, what shall I do? What shall I do? Right? And the mom says, watch and pray, dear, and never get tired of trying and never think it's impossible to conquer your fault. And um, they talk a little bit more. And the mom says, you think your temper is the worst in the world, but mine used to be just like it. And this makes Joe sit up and pay attention. Yours, mother? Why, you're never angry. And the mother says this, I've been trying to cure it for 40 years and have only succeeded in controlling it. I am angry nearly every day of my life, Joe, but I have learned not to show it. And I still hope to learn not to feel it, though it may take me another 40 years to do so. And this is exemplary, right? And it gets worse. Um, a little further on, Joe's thinking about this. She's like, Mother, are you angry when you fold your lips tight together and go out of the room sometimes when Aunt March scolds or people worry you? And the mom says, yeah, I'll just go away a minute and give myself a little shake and, and, and get it together. And Joe says, how did you learn to keep still? That's what troubles me. I, tell me how you do it. And the mom says, well, my mother used to help me, but then she passed away. But then your father came, and I was so happy that I found it easy to be good. But then when things got hard, I sometimes had trouble holding in my temper. She says, oh, poor mother, what helped you then? Your father, Joe. He never loses patience, but always hopes and works and waits so cheerfully that one is ashamed to do otherwise before him. He helped and comforted me, and he helps her out in this other kind of way, right? Joe says, I used to see father sometimes put his finger on his lips and look at you with a very kind but sober face, and you always folded your lips tight or went away. Was he reminding you then? Yes, says the mom. I asked him to help me so, and he never forgot it, but saved me from many a sharp word by that little gesture and kind look. And they're both on the verge of tears here. And on the one hand, like with Meg, right, this is meant to be an exemplary scene, learning how to conquer anger when it rises inside of you, to conquer the, the faults in your nature. And it's a moment where Joe and her mother, Joe feels very, very close to her mother. So then something intensely positive about this. But it's also like that scene with Meg telling us women's anger is not acceptable. It is not a thing. I've had it for 40 years and I've learned not to show it. I find that 
passage really hard to read. Yeah. So there's a number of ways to look at that. One of which is to remember, at the very least, although this is a passage about women's anger and women's anger comes up, it's not, the book doesn't praise men's anger either. No, I was thinking about that. As, we, as I was reading it. That's true. But it is categorized, perhaps. I don't know. We don't have as much of, a, of, a, of an insight into that. I can't really think of... Well, there is this one passage where the mom talks to Meg about John's anger. That is Meg's husband, John's oh, anger. Right. And she says, his anger is not like ours, where it's like quick, like a tempest and blows over. It's that cold anger that is slow to start, um, but then just keeps on burning. And that's that's super creepy, um, first of all. But but so so it's clear that people have anger. It's a question of what you do with it and how you manage it. There are scenes also where um, Laurie has anger, but his anger is clearly, even though it's never said explicitly, his anger is clearly of the March variety. Right. He's very he's emotionally tempestuous in ways that are very similar to Joe. Yes, and one of the tricky things here is that it does seem like it's a you know yeah you know, I hate to 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 reduce it to this, but. It is a good thing to learn techniques for controlling one's anger. Mm -hmm. And this book does provide a few methods for thinking about that. And it puts it forward in a way which is readable and perhaps very compelling mm -hmm. to especially young readers, I, I imagine. But also, we like to think about moments when you have righteous anger, when it is the correct thing to be able to use and focus that anger mm -hmm. and and affect change through it. And that doesn't seem to be a possibility in this world. No, I think that's exactly right. And there, I think gender does play a role because righteous anger might be something that would be thinkable for, for male characters here. Um, but it's clearly not something that's available to women. And again, there's a conversation along these lines. There's this one moment when Joe and Amy are talking together about I don't know, wild young men, some bad men that they know, like young, uh, not, not not evil, but, you know. Lads. <laughs> lads, yes, laddish young men. And um, Joe is saying, you know, isn't it hypocritical of us to be pleasant to them and, you know, nice to them in society? And Amy's like, it would do no good for us to be negative toward them or to reprove them. It would accomplish nothing. Mm. So she's just utterly strategic about it. I mean, they don't talk explicitly about anger in that passage, but that whole question of righteous indignation is definitely there. And Amy is totally instrumental about it. That wouldn't work. So you don't do it. Yeah. Amy is very instrumental, especially in the second half. Oh, yeah. So we should look at the other characters' arcs. Joe is at first completely dismayed by the fact that Meg is even thinking about getting married. She's completely against romance in all its forms. She wants to marry Meg herself and keep her in the family, yes, is what she says. in a very interesting moment. But once Meg leaves, Joe is able to find some happiness in Meg's new situation. Joe quite likes the babies. And now that the unit has broken up, it seems that she's much more accepting of the family unit breaking up Yeah, more. the pieces are moving all of a sudden. I mean, that's the big difference between parts one and two, right? The pieces, the four pieces are all in place. Um, in part two... They're all in motion. So Joe's friendship with Lori, the next door neighbor boy, uh, takes a turn as Lori falls for her. And there's a bit of negotiation around this because Joe responds to it at first by thinking, well, no, romance is stupid. I'm not interested in that. Yeah, but partly it's that romance is stupid. I'm not interested in that. Partly, and this is something Joe herself says, and then it comes out in more detail when she's in conversation with her mother, she and Lori are too much alike. Right. And that's the problem. And that's a very interesting problem. It's one of the features of this society in this, in this depicted in this book that they don't get a chance to prove that. Mm. Because once you have started down the, the, the loving path with somebody, that's it. There's no there's no sense that you can you can pull the brakes on this. You can you can say actually no, this isn't working out. There's no sense that Meg and John could have separated or decided not to do this after they had been uh, engaged for a few years, but not yet married, and certainly not once they're married. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So so after after Lori starts falling for Joe, Joe decides to move away, gets a job as a governess in a family in New York, and while she's there, she starts writing these sensationalistic, trashy. Uh, stories and getting paid for them and saving up the money in order to send home for dying Beth. And at some point, she decides that this is terrible, that she shouldn't be writing these these lurid stories. Well, again, she's been corrected by a man, like the others. So she meets an, uh, a man who is working in, in the household as a, as a tutor, uh, Professor Bear. And he is a very upstanding older man. He's 40, I guess. Uh, but is very clear to point out to her without fully knowing what's yeah, going on. Yeah, he doesn't on. know she's right. He he condemns those stories, you know, 
in general. Right. And she takes it as a kind of a personal corrective. He, he doesn't know that it's she's doing this. Right. But says, oh, these stories are trash and they just, you know, th- think of the children. It's this very <laughs> moral panic <laughs> argument. Mm-hmm. And she agrees with it and she stops writing and burns her manuscripts and, and has a moment where she has to decide what to do with the money, which she ends up keeping. But this sense of, well, I was doing something that was maybe bad, but it was for a good end. Comes yeah, up again and yeah. Again. it's bad enough that I'm going to burn the manuscripts and not do it anymore, but it's not so bad that I can't keep the money. There's even another scene for this earlier on when they find out that their father is sick and the mother needs to go down, but they don't have as much money and they're going to ask for a loan from their aunt, but she's very, she's rich, but she's very weird about giving money and they don't really want to be indebted to her. Joe runs off almost immediately. And when she comes back late that day, she has cut off and sold her long, beautiful hair, which- Her one beauty. Which is her one beauty, according to the sisters. And it's- a bit hard to remember this when you're reading it because it seems to us like a very noble and selfless thing. But most of the other sisters are like, that was a dumb thing to do. Why would you do that? Because although the end was noble, the means seemed to be the wrong means for them. And in fact, similar to some of the other stories, the father, as you said in the cold opening section, never spends he that never money. He never spends the money. I only noticed that this time reading it through. It only dawned on me that it really was futile. Yeah. He gives it back to her at the end, I believe. <sighs> It's 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 remarkable, but it is the wrong way of going. Apparently, the wrong way of going about doing it, even though that seems like a, a completely selfless act to us. Though it's a strange moment in so many ways when Joe cuts her hair. Right on the one hand, it's a it's a, apparently a foolish act, but for a, a noble motive to try to provide some funds to to help out. But what's the result of that? It's the twenty five dollars that doesn't get spent, but it's also how can I put it? Joe's cut her hair, right? Um, she she she's she's gotten rid of her one beauty, the thing, the one thing that made her look very feminine. You know, up until that time, she's constantly characterized by this sort of masculine behavior. She likes to be called Joe and not Josephine. She puts her hands in her pockets. She whistles. Um, there are all kinds of like funny ways, um, often comic ways, in which her her boyish quality is is brought out. Um, when Laurie trips over her when they're going off in a boat, he he says, "Oh, I'm sorry, did I hurt you, my dear fellow?" I mean, there's all these kinds of moments. And so when she cuts her hair and she just has this boy, it's explicitly a boyish crop. In some ways, it's it's a thing that, it's part of what she's been aspiring toward in a way. But paradoxically, she becomes more feminine as a result of that. So it's a very strange moment when acting out your desires, acting out your will plays into gender expectations in a very strange way. It happens over and over again, but that's probably the most dramatic moment of them all. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have said a lot of things about Joe's relationship to gender, her gender, the femininity of it. Uh, There have been some really interesting writings about Jo from both uh, lesbian and queer women uh, writers and also from trans writers. And Jo doesn't fit comfortably into any of these categories, but she is something that you can read from many different directions. And it's it's really fascinating. I, the thing that struck me the most is the passage where, in order to keep the family unit together, she says she wishes she could marry Meg herself. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's an idea that can enter into her head. Yeah, I mean, everybody thinks it's funny, but still, she said it. She you said know? it. Yeah. But one of the reasons, maybe not the primary reasons, but one of the reasons she lists for not marrying Laurie is that he's too much like a brother to her. And so this idea of this like yeah, and don't give me exogamy. Yeah, this yeah. conceptual incest or not. Like, it's totally fine for her. It's totally thinkable in this one direction and not in another. Mm-hmm. She's she, She's got a very nice and complex position in this, which I think is one of the reasons why uh, it's really enticing for a lot of readers. Yeah. Um, she doesn't do that in a vacuum because her relationship with Lori, which is an intense friendship, which which begins quite early on in the book, they're almost like a foil to one another in that respect. Because even as she violates the gender expectations by her behaviors, by by loving to run, by you know um, uh, dressing in a boyish way where possible, lolling around on the rug um, and stuff like that, he also does things that are not quite quite right. And and in different ways in the two different halves of the book. Yes. Although Joe embraces her difference, especially early on in the book. She's, you know, proudly claiming that she wishes to be boyish and and she wants to be known as Joe. Mm-hmm. Laurie changes his name. His name is Theodore. Yeah, they have a neat little conversation about this. I absolutely love it. Um, this is really near, early on in the book, right? They're introducing themselves to one another. And she says, uh, hey, you want to just do it back and forth? <laughs> sure. Okay. I'm not Miss March. I'm only Joe. I'm not Mr. Lawrence. I'm only Lori. 
Lori Lawrence, what an odd name. My first name is Theodore, but I don't like it for the fellows called me Dora, so I made them say Lori instead. I hate my name too. So sentimental. I wish everyone would say Joe instead of Josephine. How did you make the boy stop calling you Dora? I thrashed him. Oh, uh, how heteronormative. <laughs> yeah. So Lori is given this feminine name, Dora. He responds. Which he responds violently. He responds violently by thrashing back as as a boy quote unquote should and and even like I thrashed him like the fact that it's like kind of colloquial and slangy yes that's part of it that's absolutely part of it and then he he insists that they call him Lori which to our ears is a feminine name and I don't know the history of the name it's definitely a nickname still certainly so so in that sense it is diminutive and it's a name that we know definitely can be a feminine name in that period because of like songs and poems, um, Anna Laurie and stuff like that, which actually get referred to in some of Alcott's other books. So we know it's there as a potential feminine name, even if it can be a masculine name. So name-wise, they're both in this odd kind of space. And again, that's introduced up front. Um, and then they have all these conversations about possible futures they could have together, which I, I'm just like, I, I just find these intoxicating, right? At one point, he's really upset and wants to run away and wants Joe to go with him. And she says, if I was a boy, we'd run away together and have a capital time. But as I'm a miserable girl, I must be proper and stop at home. Don't tempt me. It's a crazy plan. Um, and, and so there's a whole lot of passages like this where this possible future where, you know, with her short hair, they could run off and like, you know, be two boys um, uh, in the world. Like, it's not realistic. They, they, they can't do it, but they could do it. Yeah. Let's, um, let's finish up talking about the rest of the character arcs. And then maybe we'll come back to this issue of the possibility that's always on the tip of the tongue, especially in the first half of the book, but which ultimately seems to go away or be replaced anyways. So we've talked about Jo, although we haven't gotten to her final ending yet. Amy goes off to Europe, has some interesting growth experiences there, meets up with Laurie there, and they eventually fall for each other in this really interesting substitution. This is after Laurie has been rebuffed by Jo. And eventually he realizes, <laughs> while staring at a bust of Mozart, <laughs> as one does, that if Mozart couldn't get the woman he wanted and settled for the sister, so, so he could he. too. Oh my word. It doesn't get much more inspiring than that. So yeah, so we have this really interesting situation where there's this substitution and Joe and Amy are not very similar at like all. They're the opposite. They kind of hate each other. And so for that to be the ground of the substitution is very strange. Although it seems like as a pairing, it works out reasonably well, at least the way that they depict it. Yeah. Again, you know, as with like Meg and John Brooke, I mean, they're happy, but it's strange. There's, there's, it's strange what has to be sacrificed for that to be possible. There's this one moment that I think is a very, a, a, a very lovely one. It's when Amy is in Europe and Lori has stopped by to visit with her and they're having conversations and they're outdoors in this area that's growing with roses. And he's trying to pick this one red rose that he sees there. And so this is Laurie thinking. He had thought of Joe in reaching after the thorny red rose, for vivid flowers became her, and she had often worn roses like that from the greenhouse at home. The pale roses that Amy gave him were the sort that the Italians lay in dead hands, never in bridal wreaths, and for a moment he wondered if the omen was for Joe or for himself. But the next instant, his American common sense got the better of sentimentality. So it's this weird moment where he's been reaching for this difficulty at Rose, and Amy's like, oh, we'll just pick these like cream-colored roses that are here lower down on the wall. And it's it's an odd moment on two levels, right? One is it's obviously like an allegory, right? You can't get the thorny rose that's out of reach. That's Joe. So pick these low, low-hanging low roses, you know, Amy, right? Um, and the roses do become a kind of a symbol of Amy. When Later on, when he's got her letters tucked away, he's got the dried roses, those same roses, in there with them. So she that's clearly a substitute. But it's happening it's something happening on another level as well. These these roses are not emblems of marriage. Like white roses are often conventionally emblems of marriage. These cream-colored roses in the tradition he knows um, because he's partly a, of an Italian family symbolize death. So the substitution on the one hand is like smooth and playful and charming, but also there's a kind of sacrifice entailed. And, and I think those cream-colored roses are kind of the marker of it. Well, the other side of that is that while these two are meeting up and falling in love in Europe, Beth is dying mm -hmm. back home. In a very protracted way. In a very protracted way. And before they had gone off to Europe, or before Laurie had gone off to Europe after Laurie had professed his love to Joe, she tries to deflect it by trying to get him to fall in love with Beth. Yeah, that's just crazy. <laughs> it, which is crazy. <laughs> but you can sort of see where, I don't know. I don't know. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. <laughs> 
But this moment of going for the death flowers instead of the prickly flowers is also reminiscent of this idea of turning to Beth and also what's happening to Beth far away from them Mm -hmm. and what this will allow. Because once Beth has died, Mm -hmm. it becomes much more okay to Joe that Laurie is marrying Amy. It's true. Because again, all the pieces are moving now. Right when, from the beginning of the second part of Little Women, when um, Meg gets married, all the pieces are in motion. So once Beth dies, the whole center of gravity is all changed. Right? Yeah, and this idea of the sisters substituting for each other mm-hmm. takes because on Joe your own. substitutes for Beth too. Remember, she takes on uh, Beth ex- explicitly asks her to take on her role relative to looking after the parents, which doesn't quite happen. No, not at all. But but nevertheless, it is it is there. There's this, there's this idea of how are these people interchangeable. Mm -hmm. It's also, it might also be worth pointing out that Lori early on in the book is clearly attracted to Meg. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of scenes of him being very like, oh, she's so cute. Uh, Even though nothing particularly comes of that, that he has at some point had an interest in or been attempted to be paired with all of the sisters. Because what he loves is the family. So Beth dies. Which is so weird. Just to pause over that briefly. She's, she's a character that I think everybody kind of you know, likes and feels really bad for and so on. But she's a very flat character until near the end when she talks to Joe about how she's going to die. Does that strike you? Like, did that strike you too? I always find that really uncanny because she's angry too. Hmm. She doesn't have a future. Like she's trying to be resigned and so on, but she's very angry, which is so weird that you find anger in a character like Beth, who's been the antithesis of that. Yeah. There's a scene early on where uh, all the girls and Laurie are sitting around imagining their castles in the air, their their brilliant features and the novels and, and artworks and, and musical pieces that they're all going to write and become famous and, and beloved for. And Beth doesn't have one. She's just going to stay home and help the parents, which is – it's 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 a, it's a contrast, certainly, but it does show her lack of potential plot. Well, it, come back, it comes back again to this point, which we've alluded to – earlier, you know, in talking about Little Women, but we've talked about in other contexts as well, this question of to what extent do you choose what happens to you and to what extent do things just happen to you? You know, because in that, uh, when Beth opens up to Joe shortly before she dies, she basically says, you know, you all had these dreams. You know, I I never had these dreams. I was never quite like you. And on the one hand, you know, that's a source of resignation. You know, well, I, I never had those castles in the air, so like no big diff, right? But but it's also tragic, you know, I've been cut off from something that was possible for you. And and Beth's really like very explicit about like trying to be resigned and trying to be good and trying to be patient and, you know, and all that. But she's clearly very, it's a struggle. Um, so when you talk about each of the characters trying to overcome qualities in their nature, I think because that effort is so deferred for that character, when it finally happens, it feels very, we- I, th- I think it feels very weird. The whole narrative around Beth's ultimately death it, on the one hand, it's about that character and what's happening to that character arc. On the other hand, it's hap- it, it's about death because death is almost a character in this book as well. I mean, death comes up over and over and over again in sometimes almost slightly comic and parodic context and sometimes in very, very dark kinds of ways. And, you know, when you were talking earlier about that chapter where the girls decide to take a week off and just sort of loll around and then how that car- that chapter corresponds to the time later on when they are left on their own without either father or mother at home and how that plays out. It's significant, I think, that there's an episode of death in each one of those, one that's kind of sort of comic, comic in a way that I find really repellent, um, and then um, t- totally tragic. I'm thinking of the death of Pip and then the death of the baby. Right. Um, so I'm just going to describe those briefly. So um, in that first um, episode that we were talking about a little bit earlier, where they take that week off, they're sort of neglecting their duties around the house. And one of the duties that they're neglecting is Beth has neglected to feed her parakeet, Pip. And she's really upset. A canary? A canary. Sorry, not a parakeet. I had a parakeet as a child, so obviously I've just like transposed this trauma onto my own Uh experience. And so, you know, he's dead there, lying there on the bottom of the cage. And Amy's like, well, maybe you put him in the oven and he'll get warm and he'll be okay. And Beth is like, no. She's like, he's been starved and he shan't be baked now that he's dead. <laughs> like, okay. It's awful. Um, I'll make him a shroud, she says, and he'll be buried in the garden. And I'll never have another bird, never my pit, for I'm too bad to own one. <sighs> the other side of that terrible story is that it's never, this is never explicitly said, but it's heavily implied that the mother just let this happen. Yeah. Because she's trying to show them. She's teaching them a lesson. She's teaching them a lesson. And they're going to learn lessons the hard way sometimes. Yeah. And so, yeah, she just doesn't 
intervene and, and this leads to the death of this canary. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty awful. Yeah. And, and, and so there's a lot to say about that. Anyway, but that kind of mothering anyway. And then that, you know, sort of lays the groundwork for what happens later on when they're on their own trying to manage the household. They're doing pretty well at the outset, but some things start falling through the cracks. And there are some very, very indigent neighbors, uh, a family called the Hummels, German immigrants. And so one of the children, one of the baby is sick. And so the girls have been checking on the family as their mom had asked them to. And nobody really gets it together to go except for Beth. Beth is like, oh, I don't feel so good today, Joe. Could you go do it? And Joe's like, yeah, I'm really busy. I'll go in a little bit. May, could you do it? Meg's like, no, like, I'm really busy. And so finally Beth goes and does it. And then she comes back and she doesn't come and talk to her sister. She just goes straight upstairs. And after a while, Joe's like, that's weird. And she um, finds Beth. And Beth tells her this awful story. She says, oh, Joe, the baby's dead. And Joe's like, and you, the reader, are like, what? <laughs> because it's so horrifying. I remember reading this as a child. And, and she says this, Beth says this, It wasn't dreadful, Joe, only so sad. I saw in a minute that it was sicker, but Latien said her mother had gone for a doctor, so I took baby and let Lottie rest. It seemed to sleep, but all of a sudden it gave a little cry and trembled, and then lay very still. I tried to warm its feet, and Lottie gave it some milk, but it didn't stir, and I knew it was dead. It's awful. It's awful moment. Because it's so matter of fact. Yeah, it it's matter of fact in a way that, at least to to my mind, feels very nineteenth century. Mm. Yeah, babies die. Like this is a yeah. thing that happens, and it's something. It's not that it's not sad. No, yeah, but it's something that you are accustomed to the idea. Absolutely. Of. And I don't know if you notice that there's this really absolutely chilling moment that happens very shortly after that. And I again, I remember so vividly being completely freaked out by this, reading this as a child. So this is just a few pages into Beth's illness. And so there's commentary on how beloved she is by the neighbors. It says, everyone missed Beth. The milkman, baker, grocer, and butcher inquired how she did. Poor Mrs. Hummel came to beg pardon for her thoughtlessness and to get a shroud for Minna. Mm-hmm. And it goes on. And, you know, I remember being as a kid, I didn't know what the word shroud meant. So I like looked it up and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm really sorry. My baby made you sick. By the way, can I have a shroud? For the other child, obviously, one of the other kids is also dead, right. by the way, back at the home house. I mean, and it's like, it's a support, it's it's one clause in a long sentence. And and I I guess it was because I had no idea about like 19th century mortality rates at that point, but it was just, it was so matter of fact and so trivial. So but but even now looking at it, like Beth's death, possible death, right, and, and in that illness, is seen as like catastrophic for the family. But when we're talking about the Hummels, right, these these poverty struck people, well, that is just the thing that happens. Right. So we should finish up the the plot, which is basically that after Beth dies, after the marriage of Laurie and Amy, Professor Bear, the the sensitive old man that Joe knew back in New York, comes for a visit, and after being warmly welcomed by the family because he's such a transparently good man. Well, and also he's like really loves, you know, philosophy and deep thinking, deep thoughts, like he gets on charmingly with their dad. Yes. And seems to get along very well with the kids and mm-hmm. just has a natural affinity for children. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, they he ends, he ends up marrying Joe and Joe's fine with this. And Aunt March conveniently dies and leaves them the house, leaves Joe the house and they move in and they're going to set up a school for boys. Mm-hmm. Tune in next time Tune for the in sequel. next time, exactly. <laughs> There's not a tremendous amount to say about that that ending, except that nobody seems to think that Professor Bear was good enough for Joe. No, 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 he is tedious. But, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about that is, you know, we were talking earlier about the kind of the fourfold structure of the book and the ways in which it really insists on these four options, these four paths, right? It, it actually... When she gets with Professor Bear at the end, it's mediated through that same fourfold structure. Remember, she's written this poem about the four girls, and she's written it in the form of four trunks in an attic, and each trunk contains within it objects that kind of represent Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. And the reason he's come, Professor Bear has come, is he's seen this poem uh, printed in a newspaper. He cut it out, and he says, it seemed to call to me. So in a weird kind of way, the microcosm of the girls that the book opened with is the thing that calls him to her that kind of closes it out finally. So it puts it to bed or almost is like an epitaph to that whole way of being. So, I mean, it, yeah, it's not a very satisfying ending, but she's clearly taking pains to kind of use that fourfold structure as a way of punctuating the arc of all the characters. So this is the first novel that we've done, but it's also the first book that was aimed at children that we've looked at, uh, which puts it in a very different position from a lot of other quote-unquote great books. Now, 
Did you first read this book as a child? I did. I try to remember how old I must have been. I think that I received Little Women in a set of six of Alcott's books. So I always had a, a number of her books. So I'd like read all of them or read a lot of them anyway. Um, I must have received them. I was like eight or nine. And then I finally took it off the shelf and read it for the first time, maybe 10 or something like that. So two, like I said, young enough that some of the words I didn't know. Um, so it was a book I read many times and and read the continuate like the the later books like Little Men and Joe's Boys and read other books that she wrote for children. So I have a sense of it as a kind of a universe. Um, I remember when you and I chatted first about the possibility of including it, you were a little bit like, yeah, that's sort of weird. Uh, do people still read that? And then you were asking around, and it turned out there were a number of acquaintances who had. Um, do you feel like it breaks down by gender? I mean, I I imagine it does. Uh, so I also read it when I was a kid, or I should say, I thought I had read it. I remembered reading it. From the lack of familiarity I have with most of the book, I think I only got a few chapters in before putting it down. But I would have been about nine or ten. It was my mother's favorite book, and so there was a copy around the house, and I think inspired by that, I started reading it, and then perhaps bounced off it for whatever reason. I don't think it was specifically because it is gendered female, because there were other books like Harriet the Spy that I did read and quite loved. So, Did she say it was her favorite book, or did you know it some other way? Yeah, she said it. She would would describe it as her favorite book. Mm -hmm. So... At, you know, as somebody who grew up uh, in New England in the mid 20th century, I think it it fulfilled a lot of her senses of self, her sense of fantasy, her sense of uh, how she fit in the world, and, and informed a lot of how she thought about things. Although, I don't think she easily maps on to any of the characters mm-hmm. particularly. But- no, I, I mean, and that's the weird thing about it, right? Like, it's in some ways that it's a 19th century vision of what's possible, right? But the fact that it's been remade as a movie like a billion times, right? And it keeps being read, so it's it's worth thinking about why that is. What kind of work is that book doing? Because that's quite unusual. It's clearly a book that has uh, attracted a lot of readers. It's engaging in a serious kind of way with other works um, uh, of the 19th century and also more broadly. Um, and it's, again, really boldly staking out certain kinds of possible futures in a way that I think you could do, especially with regard to girls and women, I think that you could do in children's literature in a way that you could not do in literature written for adults. You couldn't sketch out this possibility of like, you know, um, Joe having her hair cut, running off with Lori and, you know, going to sea, you know, and, you know, turning up in India in 10 years time. Like, I don't think forecasting those possible futures would you could do it in quite the same way. Whereas here, putting that in the guise of possibilities that get foreclosed but are nonetheless possibilities, I don't know, I think that's something incredibly potent. And I think that's something that happens in children's literature in a way that it doesn't happen elsewhere. When I was reading it, I was trying to really be mindful of what is this book doing? What is it doing and doing that it does well? Mm. And part of it is clarifying this approach to psychology and an approach to your own faults. Uh, or things that you perceive as faults. It gets preachy when it starts trying to foist this upon everyone else, and it gets frustrating when there really only feels like there is one possible good outcome, that that other situations aren't explored, that you don't get to see what happened to Lori's father and, and, mm-hmm. and mother, who mm-hmm. ran off to be artists, to be musicians. musicians. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, of course, Lori's big dream and the, and the grandfather's big fear. But you never really see what might come of that. What is that life like? You never get too deep in Joe's writing of sensationalist literature, which, you know, Louisa May Alcott wrote a tremendous amount of sensationalist literature, often under a pseudonym, and seemed to really enjoy that kind of writing. But you don't get a sense of what does that lead to? What 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 other options? What other ways of living uh, a satisfactory, a good life could there be? There's just no. There's just this one model that you have to figure out how to work yourself into. So it does open up a lot of possibilities. It also feels like it's closing off a lot of possibilities. But the way that it describes that is very good, and and very thoughtful and very clear in an interesting way. The way that it talks about women's lives is also really interesting. I read somebody talk about how this is the only 19th century novel that they can think of, and really one of the very few novels, that has a scene that describes sleep training babies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like, where yeah. do you find that detail? That's true. That's absolutely true. And this book is full of a lot of that stuff. The level of detail there mm-hmm. and the level of nuance of, of thinking about it is remarkable. Mm-hmm. It's also really interesting the way that it engages in literary pastiche, especially in the first half of the book. It's a third chapter. The girls are putting on a play for their friends. The play is a, a, a bit of scandal work, I suppose. It's very silly, very over the top. And the way that it's written and described is amazing because 
the plague goes south at Sirius Park. This tower that they've constructed out of the furnishings falls down. But the narrator describes all of this as if it were authentically part of the plot. So when they're when the sisters are saying, oh, I told you that wouldn't work, or whatever they say, this is, you know, Roderick, the swordsman saying this to the to the to the fair maiden. And it's just like, oh, this is amazing how 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 it's playing with the tropes of this kind of literature and this kind of imagination and mm-hmm. really, mm-hmm. really investing in it. Mm-hmm. Which, mm-hmm. It, you know, it's sort of the thing in a very different scale, in a very different way. It's sort of the stuff that Ulysses does, mm-hmm. uh, it, you know, by playing with these other texts and bringing them in. But because it's set up for kids, because it's meant to be very easy and accessible, uh, it doesn't get the same kind of appreciation Mm-hmm. As as it does when when you have high modernist pastiche. Yeah, no, I think that's right. A theatricality here uh, is a kind of a gateway into this alternative world, like the sensational fiction that you were mentioning earlier, um, like the people who we hear of only in passing, Laurie's parents, who have you know who've died, but clearly like ran away and had this transgressive life together. There there are these possibilities that exist kind of at the fringes, um, in 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 what's not quite accessible to us, but almost glimpseable. So I have a few more questions for you about your relationship with the book. Uh, first off, perhaps especially when you were a child first reading it, did you identify with one of the sisters more? Were you one of the Joes or did someone else appeal to you? What an interesting question. Um, I think that people often describe, identi- I mean, I think it's assumed that people identify with one or the other. But I, I, what I remember is sort of trying them all on. Mm-hmm. I, I, Meg did not fit well at all because I was just too outraged by the kinds of stuff that was happening. I mean, I found the passages, sections about her to be really fascinating, but I was like, could not inhabit that sensibility. Um, I actually was really fascinated by Beth. I mean, not that I thought of myself as a Beth, but like her corporeal experience is described so vividly. Um, you know, like when she's ill and you know, when she's longing for this or that, or, you know, she's someone who's, who's, who's often like yearning for something. And, and I found that kind of fascinating. So I found her as a character really absorbing. Um, uh, Joe, obviously everybody is really fascinated by, I think the character actually I was most affectively um, engaged with and most kind of inhabited in a way though was Lori, mm. funnily enough. Um, I, I love the quality of that character, the fact that his his anger or upset would almost spill over. Like, remember when Joe sends him away and, and she says, where are you going? And he says, to the devil. And she's worried for him and he's going to kill himself. But, you know, he just, he just goes off. Um, and then there's some other moments like that, too, where he's clearly, if not despairing, like he's clearly emotionally almost over the edge. And like for me, that, I, I found that character really absorbing. So, so more than any of the girls, I think Laurie. I mean, do you find that that has changed as you've read it again and again over the years, that you are more interested in trying on or or thinking with one of the characters? I've become much more interested by Amy um, because I I think for a long time was very dismissive of her because it was clear she was just, you know, again, wanting to marry someone wealthy and she'd given up. She had these grand dreams and she'd given up on those grand dreams. And so it was hard not to be disappointed in her. Um, And now reading it, you know, from a mature point of view, I, I see that as totally strategic and instrumental. And and I and I noticed this time when I was reading more than I ever had before about Amy and horses. You know, she's someone who is an, she describes a really good horsewoman. But but if you read sort of detailed passages that describe this, she's invested huge amounts of time in riding horses that are often very difficult to ride yes. in the earlier parts. Yes. And then later on, she's unusual among the community of expatriates um, in in France in that she insists on driving her own horses. And like, that's interesting. You know, what kind of person does that? You know, um, so it says something about her control of, I don't know, her surroundings and like the flesh in some ways. You know, because she can break horses. Well, that's exactly it. So um, I'm and, kind and of- And Laurie is a horse who enjoys being broken. He's, explicit, he's explicitly likened to a colt over and over again, yeah, in yeah. The, especially in the first half of the book, right? Um, so in, if we, we've we suggested earlier that Amy and Laurie's relationship is kind of just a substitute, a second best for his relationship with Joe. But in terms of the way that Amy's power works, um, that's a very good relationship. I mean, he's a very fine horse. 
Well, we've gone on very long, and I'm sure some of that's going to have to be edited out. That's okay. It's such a fun book to talk about. And also, I think partly maybe we've gone a little long because there were so many new things that we opened up here. The question of children's literature. This is the first work of modern literature that we've talked about together, 19th century American. And we will be doing more American literature later on, but we've opened up sort of a whole other area here. Yeah, we'll in fact be doing more American literature next time because we will be looking at Gertrude Stein's autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. I know. I'm really excited about that. So if any listeners want to get in touch with us, as always, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned this episode and more resources about the book are available at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash five. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, we'll see you at the Spouter Inn.